With Volume 9 just around the corner, I think now is a good time to take a look back on the events of Volume 8, what is in my opinion the most impactful volume of Ruby thus far. That isn't to discount the events of previous volumes, in particular Volume 3 and the impact that had on the overall story, having the sheltered world of Beacon that we had come to know and love literally crumble around us. Salem being introduced at the end of the volume and essentially those events kickstarting everything that followed, essentially starting the plot of the overall show. But in Volume 8, Salem took center stage. From the very first episode of the volume, war was at our doorstep. Salem was there, ready to lay siege to Atlas. Panic was everywhere in both Atlas and Mantle. People were at each other's throats. Ironwood in conflict with Team Ruby. Team Ruby in conflict with one another as well, as there were different viewpoints on who was more important to protect, whether to prioritize the people that needed help right in front of them, or prioritize the rest of Remnant, which ultimately is Salem's overall target. Not only did we get a good amount of character development for our main cast, Ren, Yang, Penny, Emerald, even Cinder, we got her backstory, something that we've been waiting on since, you know, the early volumes of the show itself. We also got the introduction of the Hound, and the implications that that carries for the Silver-Eyed Warriors and Summer Rose, slowly getting more and more information on Ruby's mother. And, yeah, I think eventually, maybe Volume 10, 11, we will finally get the full story of what happened to Summer Rose. And ultimately, this volume continued a lot of the themes that were set up in previous volumes. The idea of following orders versus thinking for yourself. The theme that was at the core of the Aesop's introduction. How they strictly followed the orders that they were given. Didn't really consider whether those orders were actually right or wrong, and even went so far as to ignoring their own emotions and how they felt about one another. In direct contrast to the way that Team Ruby operates where they do care about one another. They think individually about what is right and wrong, and, you know, if they do think something is wrong, they will state their opinion to oppose that idea, as we saw in this volume, whereas Ruby and Yang were on opposing ideas as to what they thought was right, and so they decided, or came up with a compromise, to go after both in their own way. Whether they were effective or not, you know, remains to be seen, but this volume did explore that idea very well, and it culminated in the Aesops realizing that they shouldn't put their emotions aside, that they do need to think about what they're doing and if it is right or wrong. Because, you know, Harriet, just in the sake of following orders and doing her duty, was willing to blow Mantle off of the map. At her core, she's still a good person, but you know, she's uh, she's made some mistakes and she's probably going to need to make up for those a little bit later on. But given the situation that everyone was put in in this volume, the lack of sleep, the stress, the panic that was going on, the war that was at their doorstep, I can understand the idea of, you know, wanting to have someone else take responsibility and just following the orders that came from above. I think that this theme was explored very well in this volume, as was the theme of what it means to be human. Having the opposing characters of Ironwood and Penny. By the end of the volume, Penny literally did become human, and how she was finally able to take control of her own life. Up until this point, everything had been dictated for her. She was supposed to be the next line of defense for Atlas. That was how she was introduced in Volume 3, as she was chosen instead of the Atlesian Paladin project that Dr. Arthur Watts led. Penny was meant to be the next line of defense, and then she was set up to be the protector of Mantle. Her duty, her life, was always set out for her. Even early in the volumes, we saw that Pietro was able to essentially remote control into Penny, and have free control over what she did. She was never truly in control of her own destiny, up until the end of the volume, where she was able to take control. She fought off the virus for as long as she could, and eventually, thanks to the help of her friends and the connections that she made, the very human connections that she made throughout her unfortunately short life, she was able to make her own choices. And ultimately, she did choose her own demise at the end of the volume, which in and of itself is not insignificant. In Remnant, where just stepping outside of the city, just having a panic attack or getting angry at someone could mean it draws the grim and your eventual demise, Penny was able to choose how she died. That is something very, very significant, and I hope to, at some point, go into that in its own video. But her overall story was in direct contrast with Ironwood's, 
how with Ironwood, he started giving up his humanity, caring less and less about the people around him in efforts to pursue his one overall goal. Which, yes, was to defeat Salem, the same goal that everyone should share, but his ways of going about it were to sacrifice essentially the entire populace of Atlas. Raising Atlas into the sky, into Remnant's atmosphere, was never going to be a long-term solution. Salem would have free reign over the rest of Remnant, and, well, quite frankly, dust doesn't work outside of Remnant's atmosphere. To be able to get Atlas up high enough, the facilities would have failed anyways. Ironwood only thought to stop Salem from getting the relic. I, that would not have stopped her overall takeover and demise of Remnant. He was willing to abandon his humanity, abandon his connections, and abandon what it meant to be human. Ultimately, those choices did lead to his own demise as well. Both paths led to a sorrowful conclusion, no doubt, but the paths that each of these characters followed is something very significant for the ideas explored within this volume, and I think it was explored fairly well in my own opinion, but also Ironwood's story I plan on exploring in a different video as well. And then the ultimate theme of what it means to trust someone else. This being set up all the way back in volume 6, when the truth was revealed about Ozpin, the information that he had been hiding about well, Salem and the rest of the world, and how he is kind of partially involved in the starting of all of this. Considering him and Salem have been at war with one another for centuries, millennia now. And obviously we saw how Team Ruby took that information. How they themselves could not trust Ozpin because he didn't tell them the full truth. Even though Ozpin, with all of the lives that he had lived, the many years, the many people that he did trust in the past that had just betrayed him. In fact, just the volume prior, he had just been betrayed by Leonardo Lionheart. So, of course, it's understandable why he wasn't that forthcoming with that information, but to Team Ruby, that was unforgivable. In Volume 8, though, and throughout Volume 7 as well, they learned what it means to trust people. That is why Ruby withheld the information from Ironwood. She started to see that being completely open and forthcoming with information, it may not be the overall strategy. Now, she did make some mistakes along the way. In fact, every character in the series has made mistakes. Every character is flawed, and that's a good thing. But by the end of Volume 8, each of our main cast did come to realize to a certain extent what it means to trust someone, what it means to care about someone, what it means to be human and think for yourself. This is why we also had Emerald changing sides. She you know, throughout the early volumes, was just following the orders of Cinder. We did get to see that she has quite a personality herself and does like to think for herself, but because she felt that Cinder was the only one who cared about her, she was willing to follow her orders unquestioningly. And now Emerald is on the other side, fighting against Salem rather than for her. And speaking of development in characters on Salem's side, we got a lot of development in Cinder's character in this volume, finally getting to see the backstory, what set Cinder on this path. And honestly, it is a really sad and sympathetic backstory. No one should have to go through what Cinder went through. It was a horrible situation she suffered for years, and it's really unforgivable that things like that happen in Remnant. But, in the same vein, it's also unforgivable the actions that Cinder took afterwards. The amount of lives, the amount of blood that is on Cinder's hands is something that will never be wiped clean. In her pursuit of power, she has dealt irreparable damage to countless lives and really remnant as a whole with the hand that she played in Salem's plans. But more so with her character development, we now know why she is lusting after power so much, why she fears being powerless. It also makes sense as to Cinder's character development from Volumes 1 to 3 to everything that followed afterwards up until, you know, near the end of Volume 8. In the first three volumes, she was very cunning, manipulative, stayed in the shadows, and had others do her bidding for her, relying more on her skill set rather than the maiden powers. But once she got that power, she became drunk with it. She relied on it more and more, less so on her semblance, less on her weapons, and less on her manipulative tactics, using other people to do her work for her. That was the cinder that a lot of people loved in the first three volumes, and, well, 
you know, myself included, we started to like Cinder less and less throughout the volumes, not only because of the atrocities she was committing, but also because of, well, it felt like she was kind of lacking in character. And that was by design. Cinder was focused on that power. Now that she had a little bit of it, she wanted all of it. Though, thanks to Watts and the, uh, <laughs> the verbal beating that he gave Cinder, which, by the way, one of the best moments of this volume. My goodness, that was fantastic to see. Watts MVP. But, thanks to that, she started to return to those previous tactics, using other people for her own gain. She ended up using Watts, she ended up using Neo, and it worked very well for her. By the end of the volume, the protagonists suffered a crushing defeat. This was a complete victory for Salem. Salem now has two of the relics. An entire kingdom is wiped off of the map. The impact that this volume has cannot be understated. Not to mention, it also left off with probably the biggest cliffhanger we've had thus far, of Team Ruby, Jean, and Neo falling into a void that leads to another world. If we want to talk about implications that a cliffhanger can have for a story, it's kind of hard to uh, go bigger than introducing an entire other world to a series that really hadn't had one before that at all. Which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. I'm curious to see how Another World and its implications and interactions are going to uh, develop for the overall plot of Remnant moving forward into Volume 9, but that's something we'll have to wait and see in a little while. But for now, in the case of Volume 8, I think it is truly the best volume of Ruby so far. With every volume that we see of this show, the pacing, the writing, the animation, everything about it is continuously getting better. And Volume 8, from my perspective, is just showing how much they are improving with each and every volume. So I have high hopes for Volume 9 that they are going to continue on that path. Now, although I do have high praises for Volume 8 as a whole, it's not without its issues, most of which are caused by limitations that they had, especially moving into the pandemic, having to work from home, and the crunch times that they've experienced because of that, things had to get cut from the volume itself. After watching like the DVD director commentary, you tend to learn a lot of things from behind the scenes. How a lot of storyline that was evolving Crow and Robin had to be cut. How the Grim River really wasn't that significant throughout the volume. Something that really frustrates me, because we had this massive Grim River introduced in the early episodes of Volume 8 that was heading it towards Mantle, and I remember saying it in my review, this is going to be incredibly significant, and then it amounted to a whole six sentinels being shot up to Atlas, and then they just burrowed into it, took out the barrier, and that was it. That was the entire Grim River, and they do mention that in, um, in the director's commentary as well, that that was an underdeveloped plot line. They had a lot more planned for that, including a mini boss that was going to be in Mantle, but you know, time constraints, they had to end up cutting that plot line, but still made use of it nonetheless. The writers and crew are definitely getting better at determining what they can and can't do, how much they can fit into a specific volume, and what plot lines they can actually pursue uh, throughout multiple volumes and, and things like that. They are getting better with it. It's not perfect yet, but still, I like seeing how things are progressing with the series. Another gripe that I have, and this is just a limitation with the animation and how much they would have to animate, is in the crossroads, the fact that it was only Team Ruby, Team Juniper, and Penny that were fighting against Cinder and Neo. That was it. There was not a single other Atlesian soldier. No one with a blaster was firing on her whatsoever. And also, uh... No other Huntsman or Huntress was there. All of the Happy Huntresses, I understand why they would have moved through the portal before Cinder let off her blast, even though the blast and her attacks started very soon after everyone entered the crossroads. Like, there is some uh, criticisms to be had about the choreography of it, but I understand why the focus was on Team Ruby, Team Juniper, and Cinder, because those are the impactful characters, the characters that we've come to know, the characters at the center of this story. I still wish that we would have gotten some more there, especially with the soldiers, because it's kind of left ambiguous if Team Ruby created any portals at all on the battlefield to rescue any of the soldiers that were remaining from the Atlas army. 
For example, you know, Team Funky. Were they still left out on the battlefield? How many people were left behind in Atlas when it crashed to the ground? And, and things like that. Things that may be explored when we finally see Vacuo and the number of people that were able to make it through the portals. Regardless, the life loss in Atlas and Mantle is still going to be quite high, given that by the number of portals and pathways that we see in the crossroads, they likely didn't have enough portals created to cover every inch of Mantle and Atlas where every person could be hiding away. And so I would love to see that explored in future volumes when we get to Vacuo and uh, get a little bit of an expansion on it. Maybe we'll get that, maybe we won't, maybe it'll be released in an interview at some point, we'll have to wait and see. And of course, I couldn't go on without mentioning that it was unfortunate how Pietro and Maria kind of had the spotlight for one episode. It was good that they got the spotlight and were very relevant for the part that they played, but then didn't really have a part for the rest of the volume. It makes sense, given that, well, they wouldn't really have much of a part to play, considering it's all just pretty much all-out warfare at that point. Um, but I hope we find out what exactly happened to them, if Crow and Robin and the rest of the Aesops are going to be able to pick them up somewhere out in Atlas, if they even survived the crash, and uh, things of that nature. So, I wish we could have gotten a little bit more info on certain things, but overall, I think this volume is excellent. I think it is the best volume of Ruby so far, in my opinion. Each volume has been improving on the last, and volume 8 is no different. I expect the same for volume 9. This volume was truly the most impactful. And the last thing I do want to touch on is the named characters or the known characters that we saw perish in this volume. Because that really lent to the impact. In this volume, we've had more, like, known characters die than in any volume before. Which, as the stakes of the show continue to increase and the situations become more and more dire, it makes sense that more characters are going to meet their end. But each of them in this volume had meaning behind them, given the stories that we had come to know about each of these characters. Watts, the man who wanted to see Atlas fall, got his wish. Only, he fell alongside Atlas. And in part due to the very words that he himself said to Cinder, she can't just be strong, she has to be smart. And that got her to start using people yet again which is why she started using Watts. And so, he did get his wish, but ultimately led to his own downfall as well. Then there's Vine, the member of the Aesops who was the most stoic and logical of them, making the most logical choice for the desired outcome. He decided to stop pushing aside his emotions and chose to sacrifice himself for his friends, which, in the grand scheme of things, may not be that logical, but to him, it was the choice that was his own desire, and he made that ultimate sacrifice, as did Hazel, the man who fought for years trying to get revenge for his sister, knowing that Ozpin was at the center of why she died. Granted, his logic was built out of rage, considering he was fighting for Salem, the very person that his sister was fighting against, even though she may not have known it at the time, he eventually made the choice that his sister would have done, and fought for what is right, fought against the enemy that plagues the entirety of the world. And of course, we cannot overlook the deaths of both Penny and Ironwood, whom I've already mentioned. Penny, the girl who throughout her entire life has been controlled in some way or another, got to make the choices for herself. And Ironwood, the man who was willing to sacrifice everything and everyone in pursuit of the goal of defeating Salem, was not able to even lift his weapon when faced with the enemy he fought so hard to try to defeat. And this is actually something that has been planned since before the first volume of Ruby. It was mentioned in the director's commentary of volume 8 that they initially planned for the Atlas arc to be Volume 3, which, obviously considering the amount of things that they had to cover, ended up being Volume 8, but this was something that was initially planned, that after sacrificing everything, well, Salem would have the ultimate victory in Atlas, that she would be able to walk past Ironwood, who was completely defeated, and he would be able to do nothing against her. This is such a unfortunately sad, but also poetic end for Ironwood. Oh, and uh, of course, lastly, we can't forget Jacques Schnee, who met his end in this volume as well, which 
I think has the most perfect end out of all of the characters mentioned thus far, because Jacques Schnee, the man who wanted to be so important in Atlas, to be on the top of the world, essentially, head of the council, control of the dust market, he wanted to have all of this power and control, and he was nothing more than an afterthought. When Watts let Ironwood out of his cell, Ironwood picked up his weapon, and Jacques opened his mouth. And Ironwood just was like, all right, you're still here. Well, goodbye. And then he was never heard from again. That, in my opinion, was perfect. But in conclusion, I think this volume was excellent. Not perfect, not by any means. Every volume has its own flaws, as does every season of every show that exists. But, you know, it is constantly getting better. I love the characters. I love the series. I love the world that is being built. And I'm really excited to explore the next world that we will get to see in Volume 9. So let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. What was your final opinion on Volume 8? Was there any of these topics or any other topics that you can think of that you want me to expand upon in other videos prior to Volume 9 coming out? I know I haven't made uh, many videos in the last few months. There's uh, been some things happening in my personal life. If you've been present during my Twitch stream, you already know some of the story and some of the things that have been going on, which, by the way, I did start streaming on Twitch, so if you guys want to uh, join in there every Tuesday and Saturday, uh, I'm on Twitch. Links in the description below if you guys want to check that out, but let me know, most importantly, what your comments are on Volume 8 down in the description below. I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. And with that being said, make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Join the Guild of the Eternal Flame, tweet me at PhoenixKnight7, and I'll see you guys in the next video.